FME OK. Coming up on today's bonus edition of the stream, some memorable moments that happened during the show and after the show. Stand by to hear about a mum in a US immigrant detention center and the doctor who tried to trick her into having a hysterectomy. It is a real life horror story. And I'll take you behind the headlines of protests in Colombia with Amnesty International. Let's start with Denmark's controversial decision to review the residential permits of Syrian refugees. Now, if their permits are revoked, they have to leave Denmark immediately or they're detained. This show was so contentious that the guests continued their intense debate long after the broadcast ended. Well, they're not imprisoned. They are allowed to leave. Uh, this, this is people who, whose residence has been revoked, so they are asked to leave Denmark, and if they refuse to leave Denmark, then they will be placed in a departure center. Uh, but it's not a prison. You can, yeah, walk out the door. Uh, but you're not allowed to, um, to, to study. You're not allowed to work. Uh, it's meant for you to uh, wait there until you're uh, on your own accord, uh, leave, leave Denmark. How long are you going to wait there for? Um, I think that's individually. I don't know how uh, long is uh, the norm. I think that most people who are placed in one of these... 27 years is the maximum. 27 years yeah. so far. I think most people leave Denmark and, and try to uh, get asylum somewhere else in Europe. Well, because because yes. they, they... And do you think that's a good idea? Do you think it's a good idea that Denmark exports our refugees to other countries in Europe? Is that a solution? So it's, I it's think there's no solutions to these problem. things, uh, but it's a less bad solution than having no consequences for uh, having your residence permit sorry, revoked. Sorry, 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 sorry. But less why would bad, you take sorry. away a residence permit if you know already that you can't deport people and it's too unstable to send them back by force? Ma What's well, the idea of revoking a uh, needles, needles, less bad. So less bad, it's... So less bad... Bad is they are staying in Denmark. Less bad they are getting getting away and seeking asylum other other place. Can you hear yourself? I'm sorry, Niels. With all due respect, can you hear yourself? You're saying it less bad. So because you are from the first perspective uh, looking to these people like bad or tr problem for you. So either way, you, they will vanish or or the, you export your bad problem. Is that is that your opinion on this? I don't think so, Neil. Yeah, I don't think these people are bad, and I would definitely do the same if I was in that situation. But it's not uh, sustainable to have and open borders for a country like Denmark. People. It's not sustainable to have a free migration, and that's what you're going to have if it's there's no consequence for having your residence permit uh, revoked. If you can just stay, uh, well, borders. then you sort of have open borders, and there's no public support nope. for that in Denmark. And it's if you want true. to no. keep no. the Danes helping refugees, uh, then you have to uh, respect that Danes but want to help refugees, but not have migration. Treat people like they are a burden or the cancer of the society, which they are not. Even if the labor market, you are, uh, you are standing in, in that the labor market, they, 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 they never been better integrated in the labor market better than these last four or five years. I'm sorry. I'm sorry to, uh, to say that you are wrong. And, and yes. the problem is all of the, these 40 years uh, immigration or integration problems, it's like you are punishing the newcomers last five years by all of these old burdens. I'm sorry, I'm talking to your human conscious. This is... As this I is, said in the beginning of the program, Nils, integration is actually working better now than it has ever been working. And you know that. So stop talking about refugees who came 40 years ago. That was another situation, another society. We didn't know how to solve problems back then. But we have the tools Nobody now. Knew. We know what to do. It's working. If you look at the Eritreans who come from an even more undeveloped country than, oh, I, don't, I wouldn't say Syria is undeveloped at all, but Eritrea is undeveloped in many ways. It's very, very different from Denmark. But still, the Eritrean men, they work now after five years in Denmark to the same extent as yes. we Danish women do. That's a miracle yes. in my views. And yeah, why would you ever, let, let you me, never mention me, the me, success me stories. I'm sorry to interrupt. Uh, Nils, you know 
or maybe you have access to the, the, the database and you know that most of Syrians are young. So this is manipulation of the labor market because most of the Syrians are in in in, in school. They are getting some, uh, some study, university, institute in order to be a human and contribute to the society. You know that they are, most of them are young people and they are in, 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 the, in the way to finish their uh, study in universities, institutes, college, you know that. So we are, when, when, we, children... when we take, when we take the uh, labor, labor card, labor card, it's not working for the Syrians because you know, and we all know, I'm a Syrian, I know, they are young. They are not in your statistic because just they are simply in the, in the universities and schools. And if you look um, at the second generation of refugees, the children who come as refugees, they actually perform better in the education system now than Danish young, young, young people do. So it's just, uh, it's not true I, to I wish all these things were repeating correct, but that integration is not working. If you look at, for example, unemployment uh, statistics, uh, Syrians, uh, they don't fare too well. Um, but I think there's two different uh, tracks here. Uh, one is yes, uh, migration is. and what kind of skills and uh, uh, what's got for the Danish economy. Uh, and you are that's one debate. Yeah, let, let, also let, let, debate. Let, 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 let me just ask you, let me just ask, let me just ask Niels one, one thing. Niels, uh, Faraz and Mikela, they they are trying really hard to persuade you. Is there anything they could say that would persuade you that Syrian like refugees that. who have lived in Denmark for a very long time should not be sent back to Syria? Let's just see if there's anything, if there's anything that you could do, because you, you've worked really hard. Nils. I don't think there's a chance of convincing Danes to help uh, refugees if they know that refugees will eventually become immigrants because Danes would like to help refugees, but there's not a lot of will to have an uncontrolled uh, migration to Denmark. And if we keep making refugees into immigrants, I think the public will to help refugees will erode. Um, so sort of not, uh, I think I'm also trying to convince uh, my two co-panelists and uh, that's probably working just as well. Let me tell you something, Nils. Mm -hmm. You start off and as I a refugee, you become a refugee, not by choice. It's something that happens to you suddenly. You are not prepared for this. Nobody chooses to be a refugee. It's a terrible thing that happens to you. And then you go to your host country and you find some kind of tranquility, some kind of future that you start building up and make a new life. And then you become a citizen in that new country. You don't become an immigrant. It's nonsense. You are a refugee, which you didn't choose to become. And then you become a Dane slowly. That's what happens. Mikala, Fawaz and Niels there proving that a great debate hardly leads me to be in it at all. Now, a new film from my colleagues at Fort Lines inspired an entire episode of The Stream this week. No Consent focuses on an immigration detention centre in the US state of Georgia. Women detained there complained about abuse, neglect and forced medical procedures. Guests Haromi Navarro, Elora Mukherjee and Setare Gandhi Hari tell me what went so wrong and why. The, the, the main thing to note here, right, is that Erwin, uh, unfortunately and sadly, is not unique. Mm -hmm. um, and it's not just private detention. It's all of the detention centers across the country, whether they're private, whether they are um, local and county jails, whether they are run by the federal government. There have been countless reports from advocates including Detention Watch Network and many others over the years. You know, the government's own inspectors have documented physical, sexual abuse, medical negligence, really throughout the U.S. immigration detention system across the country. Uh, so this is really a, a big problem. And, and the fact that we were able to get this win at Irwin because of the bravery of, of um, women like Haromi is, is a huge, um, huge victory. And I'm just so honored to be here with her. Let's start talking about some of this abuse, Elora. If you could lay out where these complaints of neglect and abuse started from, this particular facility in Georgia. So Can you help us understand? Yeah, go ahead. Starting as early as 2018, 
Lawyers representing women at the Irwin County Detention Center notified both ICE and the private prison corporation, LaSalle, that women were being abused by the, gyneco the gynecologist who was providing services there. And as early as 2018, lawyers raised a, an alarm saying that this doctor leaves women traumatized and abused, and they don't want to go back to him. But for years, continuing through last fall, when the whistleblower complaint was filed, women kept being brought to this gynecologist, and woman after woman after woman was subjected to non-consensual, medically unnecessary gynecological procedures and surgeries. So surgeries and procedures that they did not need, surgeries and procedures that left them in trauma and in pain lasting to this day. Now, what happened is that the women, brave women like Haromi, organized inside the prison to shed light on the truth of what was happening that woman after woman after woman was being abused there. I, I can't underscore enough this point around, you know, retaliation. Because ICE and detention center staff are able to act with impunity, the threat of retaliation and abuse when people speak out is very, very real. You know, people are, as she said, put in solitary confinement. Their deportations can be sped up. They're often denied, you know, the most basic necessities and due process when they speak out. Physical force, rubber bullets, pepper spray, these are all very often used, including also force feeding or threats uh, of force feeding hunger strikers. You know, last year, thousands of people across the detention system took part in hunger strikes to bring attention to the situation they were facing inside because of COVID, the lack of PPE, the lack of testing, the, the lack of soap. Um, and many of them were subject to these, these types of retaliation. So it's, it's a, real, uh, a real threat. And I did experience uh, lies and confusion uh, on my way to surgery. And it, it was a bad experience, to be honest with you. It was scary. The first time I met Dr. Min, he said I needed surgery. The first, very first time he ever met me, he said, you need surgery because you have a cyst on your right ovary. I've had two kids, you know, I was 27 at the time and I had never heard of a cyst. So I was very surprised when he told me that. What I picked up from your story that shocked me and brought me back to the history of experimentation on black and brown people in the United States was that you came to the doctor with cramps and the doctor was planning on giving you a hysterectomy that you had no idea was going to happen. I'm, I'm going to leave it there because people can follow more of your story by watching the Fort Lines episode, No Consent. But just hear that, audience, because that is shocking. In the documentary, No Consent, your little girl makes an appearance. Um, and I want to share her with the world because uh, Monica, who was the correspondent, asked your little girl about you because when you revealed what was happening at the detention facility, you were very swiftly deported. And so now you are in one country, your little girl is in the United States, you're not together. This is what your little girl had to say about that. We have so much memories of, with her and those make me cry all the time. So if we can just have more memories and play together with my little sister. Oh, of course. That'd be amazing. And what would you do if you see her? What's the first thing you would do? I would hug her really tight. Harami, this way that you spoke out, you stood up for yourself and for other women. Would you ever think about taking that back, rethinking where that got you, or would you have been deported anyway? I would speak up a thousand times over again. I would have never kept my mouth shut because it's pain that I had never experienced. But when I did, it was hurtful. It just, it could have lost your mind. You can see more of Hiromi's harrowing story in the Fort Lines film, No Consent. It's streaming online now at aljazeera.com.
I can highly recommend watching the stream live on YouTube. So you can comment, debate, and maybe even get your point of view into the show. Following the ceasefire between Israel and Hamas, we asked what's left of Gaza's fragile health system. Almost 6,000 viewers jumped into the live chat during the show, and Michelle Ayres was one of them. She had a question for guest Dr. Hassan. He's a plastic and reconstructive surgeon who works regularly in Gaza. Michelle wrote, wait, Hamas can't afford to give people bomb shelters, but they can afford to give them plastic surgery. Here's Dr. Hassan, who had just finished operating on patients all day in Gaza. So I am older than Hamas, and I remember the Israelis were killing Palestinians in Gaza before 88 and before 82. And, you know, before I was born and before the PLO was born in 65, Gaza was under attack by continuous Israeli raids. There was a big massacre in Khan Yunis uh, when Ariel Sharon, as a, a, a young commander in the Israeli army, led a raid into Khan Yunis in 56 and killed over a thousand people, lined them up against the wall and shot them. So this idea that a kind of amnesic uh, 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 view of Gaza's history uh, starts and ends with Hamas. The other issue is plastic surgery is reconstructive surgery. You know, if you cannot use your hand, uh, uh, if you cannot use your hand, you cannot use your hand. It means that your, uh, uh, your uh, uh, income generating ability diminishes greatly. It means that your life is heading in a trajectory that's reduced. My barber needs plastic surgery so he can stand up. Not so that he can have facelift and, and lip enlargement. No, so he can feed himself and feed his children. So he can try to undo, even by whatever m measure that we can give him, the damage that uh, the weapons of war have inflicted on his body and his life. So this idea that, you know, the, these people are having some kind of luxury uh, uh, surgery uh, is false and, and insidious. In the bonus edition of the stream, we aim to bring you candid moments that you don't get to see during the live show. After I wrapped up the discussion about Gaza's crumbling health system, the guests and I talked about the mental health of Palestinians living under occupation. A video comment from the Red Cross kicked off that conversation. Gaza, 47% of the population are children under 18 years old. And we can assure you that 100% of these children will experience some kind of trauma following the end of this, uh, of, this, of this conflict. So it's important here to highlight the fact that Responding to medical, to mental health, uh, to mental health needs, and providing mental health assistance could be as life-saving as providing urgent uh, medical care or providing uh, clean water. Um, mental health is very important, and I came to know this uh, before the war, unfortunately, in a very harsh way. Um, and during one of our projects, one of the people who was shot in his leg um, as a result of the great marshes of return at the borders of Gaza, he was getting the golden standards of treatment in terms of physical treatment. However, he committed suicide. He burned himself alive. That is due to the fact that he was mentally affected so much by his injury that he committed suicide. This is to add to the fact that, for example, my children as a result of the 11 days of assault, my my eldest is six years old, and my, my and his sister is four years. They can now distinguish by the sound F-35 rockets from F-16 rockets, from Palestinian rockets, from naval fire incidents, from from from. How are you going to recover the mental health of those people? Adding to it the fact that not only children are in need, like what the lady said in the video. We adults are in need of, of, of mental health, you know, support. And I am telling you, like, we have been working tirelessly during those 11 days. And sometimes we were pushing ourselves, to be honest with you, because we knew that if we didn't provide the service, 
people would be dying. That, after the 11 days of assault have ended on Gaza, when we spoke to each other at the office as colleagues, we were really, you know, shocked by the stories that we were hearing. And how, how did we actually survive those 11 days mentally? That's really tough. And helping the helpers is one of the most important also aspects, in addition to helping the population who were suffering during those 11 days. I, one thing just to also keep in mind is this is a population that um, has gone through a lot. Um, it's not always the acute violence, and it's also the violence of everyday life. And everyday life in Gaza has, um, is also very difficult. Uh, and I think, you know, what we do need to think about is when we're talking about mental health, it's also again, I'm going to sound like a broken record, addressing the root causes, but then also thinking about what are the best ways that people can actually heal. And a lot of the times that also needs um, collective healing and it also needs um, dealing with the more maybe acute or severe cases, but keeping in mind that we need to try to prevent this re-traumatization re from um, continually taking place. And finally, an interview from the stream's Instagram live series. It airs Monday to Wednesday at 20.30 GMT, and you can find all of the conversations on the AJ Stream's IGTV page. Now, often we discuss stories on Instagram that aren't getting much news coverage anywhere else, like the current protests in Colombia. When I spoke to Erica Huevara Rosas, the America's director at Amnesty International, she talked about how activists in Colombia are using digital platforms and how some social media companies and authorities are trying to stop them. Yeah, but social media has become an important tool for organizing and mobilization all over the world. Uh, youth, you know, movements are the ones who are teaching us how to use social movement, uh, social media as, 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 as a tool of social change. And it's been extremely powerful from the hundreds of videos that we are getting uh, from the ground that we are verifying, they come from, through social media, right? They they kind of tag us and say, Amnesty, look what's, what's going on in Cali or what's going on in Bogota or in Medellin, right? Mm -hmm. So we are able to look at these videos and verify and, and look at the weapons that the police are using. So they have become such an incredible tool for the human rights work that we do. But on the other hand, we also have the companies and the companies are becoming a, an extremely powerful force that can censor that can support governments to persecute people, that can silence people who are utilizing social media as the only tool they have to call for action and to call for help. And this is something very important. And Amnesty has been working not only in documenting the censorship that is happening, the silencing that is happening, but also the violence that sometimes is permitted and perpetuated by the companies in these social uh, media platforms, right? Uh, we've been denouncing, we've been also talking to the companies and ensuring that they also fulfill the responsibilities on, on human rights protection. Uh, and, and also very important that these social media platforms are used in a responsible responsible way for this for these companies by these companies to give people you know a voice to give people the space to demand the exercise of human rights and accountability for the government so it has been such an important tool and yes we've been already documenting some of the cases that you are mentioning people uh, who were posting videos online and disappear in our case for instance when we were posting on social media some of the the, the videos that we have verified to denounce what's going on in Colombia we have also been censored and have some of these restrictions ourselves. The way that people are organizing, particularly youth, particularly feminist movements in within these protest movements, is so powerful that exchanging, you know, these experiences can also uh, help people to not only to feel the solidarity, but also to come up with alternatives, right? to the issues that we are facing and confronting. So, and this is a role that Amnesty is trying to play, given the fact that we have presence in many different parts of the world. We are trying to serve as a platform so that these movements can connect, these protest movements can connect and can come up with, with alternative solutions to the issues that they are facing. And that's our show for today. I'll leave you with scenes from recent protests across Colombia. Thanks for watching. See you next time.